Yeah, hi, my name's Paul Andrews, and um, I'm going to talk to you about this, engagement with maths uh, using technology. Before I kind of get into it, though, I just kind of want to put everything into context in terms of why am I here? Why am I standing in front of you fine and lovely people today? Um, essentially, what I do at the moment is I work um, as the head of this thing called the Centre for Digitally Enhanced Learning in the University of Wales Newport, and it's our job to act as consultants uh, and educators to staff, students and external clients in how they can best use technology to achieve the things they want to achieve. And we specialise in free and open source technology. So all of the solutions we provide and everything I'm going to give you today is free. And you can use this today or tomorrow or whenever it is you go back into work. So I'm not going to bang on too much about it, but if you do want to know a, a, a little bit more about my department, the web address is there. There will be web addresses that I'm going to show. I'll leave them up on screen for a little bit amount of time if, uh, if you want to write them down. Um, also, the, hopefully, there should be time for you to ask questions at the end of this. Um, however, for those of you that are on Twitter, if you're comfortable with using Twitter, if you want to tweet me, you can do. This is my Twitter handle here. And I promise I will get back to each and every one of you who asked me a question via Twitter, either during the course of the day or over the weekend. I'm going, to talk, I'm going to walk you through this. This is, this is what I'm going to take you through. Um, but before I kind of get into this, I just want to explain how I got into educational technology. Um, essentially, I, I used to be a maths teacher. But before I became a maths teacher, I worked in industry as a systems analyst and web designer. This is kind of around about 2000, 2001. Um, and then when I went into education and became a maths teacher, I started teaching everything from basic skills right up to access and foundation with A-level and GCSE in between. And I worked in the support centres. And again, like some of the previous speakers have said today, you know, you, you have a whole kind of range of, of problems come to you. So one minute you'll be doing basic maths, next minute you might be doing integration, next minute you're doing something else. So um, we had... We had a, a wide range of students, and I was working in a college in Cardiff, and it's at this point that I said, well, hang on a second, I need to do something for these students to allow them to access the learning resources that they're asking of me, but any time they want to. Now, this is back in 2002, 2003, so Moodle wasn't around, Blackboard wasn't around. So we created, I created something, I hard-coded it, and I just want to show you a very quick video that we made for the students, explaining to them what we did for them. And this, this video kind of set me off on the journey and has resulted in me standing in front of you here today. So it's only a couple of minutes long, but we'll see how we go. So that was about 10 years ago. Um, and it was at this point that I, I mean, the results from this were phenomenal. I mean, basically, we were having students engage with, particularly male students who wouldn't come to see me face to face, were able to engage with this stuff. Um, and it was after I started doing this that I kind of thought, well, hang on a second, there might be a full-time job in this, because this is, this is quite fun, I quite like this. Um, and that's when I was lucky enough to become an e-learning manager at a college in um, Gloucester. Now... In my experience, I mean, so I've been an e-learning manager and a learning technologist now for about eight years, and in my experience, when we talk to people about integrating technology into their job, into their teaching practice, their working practice, they tend to fall into one of these three categories. So using technology to help with administration and logistics, particularly things like registers or maybe online submission and marking. Using technology to truly enhance teaching and learning. I'll come on to that in a little bit. And something's cropped up quite recently, when I say quite recently, I'm talking the last two or three years, the idea of using technology to establish networks of people who you wouldn't otherwise get to meet, either locally, nationally, or internationally. So what I want to do is take you through each of these three, three things and give you some tools that you, you might want to use that will help you with these three things here. So the first one I've got is administration and logistics. And what I've done is I've put up four logos um, some of you might be familiar with some of them. I'm just going to kind of talk you through them, really. The first one we've got here is something called Dropbox. Now, when, we, when I'm talking to staff and students, one of the things that they, one of the challenges they have is they do a lot of work at home or on their own devices. And they need to get that work that they're doing from their home device into work or vice versa. And so they might do this in a number of different ways. They might email it to themselves. They might stick it on a USB stick. I've seen staff with like five USB sticks hanging off a key fob. And that's fine, but the problem is, and as I'm sure you might have experienced this yourself, USB sticks can get lost or broken. And every single year we have at least one student that comes up to us with a final year dissertation assignment on this USB stick that's been through the washing machine or even worse, the pet dog. 
So what we say to them is consider using Dropbox. What Dropbox lets you do is this. It puts a special blue folder on your computer. Anything you put into that blue folder is then automatically copied on the, onto the internet, onto Dropbox uh, website. You can then log onto the Dropbox website and access these files. So they're all backed up. So if, you, if your laptop gets damaged or broken or stolen, it's not a problem, all your files are there. But Dropbox also works on smartphones and tablets. You can install Dropbox on any internet-enabled device, and it will put this special blue folder on all of your devices. And then if you put a file into this blue folder, it will be synchronised across all of your devices. So this means you can be working on a document at home, save it into your Dropbox folder, and have access to that same document on your smartphone whilst you're waiting for the bus stop. It also works the other way. You can take a photograph on your phone, save it into a blue folder on your phone, and it will automatically be waiting for you on your computer with your blue folder. So where I'm working at the moment, we have staff that have installed Dropbox on their work computers and their home computers. And this means they can seamlessly pop a file in that blue folder and know it will be, it will be waiting for them wherever they decide to pick it up from. So it's quite handy. <coughs> We're also encouraging all of our students to get a Dropbox account purely because, yes, they have access to university systems, but Dropbox is theirs for life. It's theirs. They get two gigabytes of free storage, which means all of their work is backed up. And Dropbox also keeps every version of a file you've ever had as well. So if you're writing an essay and you, make it, then you mess it up or whatever, you can go back onto Dropbox. It's got like a time machine. You can get version 9, 8, 7, 6, right the way back to when you started. So it's a free service. It's really good. But Dropbox is one of the things that solves a lot of problems or headaches for staff and students when it comes to administration and logistics. Next thing up, up here is this funny little triangle called Google Drive. Google Drive used to be known as Google Docs, but it's recently changed its name to Google Drive. And the reason we recommend Google Drive to a lot of people is because, um, well, you might have a situation where your head of department wants you to collaborate on a document. And this might seem familiar to you. Your head of department might say, OK, I'm going to have that document and I'm going to email it out to five people. So the second they, that they hit send, five copies of that document are now out there in the wild. And if you're lucky, each of those five individuals will write their comments on that document and they will send it back just to their line manager. If you're unlucky, though, they will decide to copy in every other person who was on the original email. And for those of you that are familiar with permutations and combinations, you'll know that the number of copies of documents flying around with different comments on can increase quite dramatically. It gets out of control. What Google Drive lets you do is this. It says, right, take a document, put it on the internet, give it a unique web address. You send the web address to people, they all arrive at the same place on, the, on one document. They can then edit that document, either in real time, you can see them typing, it's all colour coded, or they can do it at times and places that suit them best. And again, this works on smartphones and tablets too, it's not just about computers. So one person might make their changes and comments at 9 o'clock, someone might then log in at 1 o'clock. But Google Drive doesn't just work for word process documents, it also works for presentations and spreadsheets and graphs and charts as well. Another thing that's quite handy, and we use this a lot with our students, is Google Drive will let you make online surveys, data collection. So you can create an online survey, and again, you have this web address. And people go to this web address, they fill the survey in, Google Drive will then collect all that data and put it into a spreadsheet for the student, ready for processing, there's no keying of, keying of data. It will also then live graph the data as it comes in using the most appropriate graphical uh, solution depending on the type of data that's coming in. This means that if you are teaching numeracy to students who need to have some kind of math element but they're not doing a math degree, but they need to be able to interpret the data to get information out, they can actually focus on the data interpretation rather than getting hung up on, well, how do I draw a pie chart? If it's not necessary for their curriculum but they need to interpret the data, Google will help them do that. And it's all free. It's a very pow powerful service. Our psychology students love it. It'll do, quanti it'll do qualitative data as well as quantitative data, but it's main strengths line quantitative data. And um, a, lot, a lot of people pay for like, things like SurveyMonkey and stuff. Don't bother. This is completely free and it works and it's scalable. You get thousands of people filling in one form and it'll handle it, no problem at all. You can also export the results, by the way, as an Excel spreadsheet. So if you do want to plug them into I don't know, F SPSS or R or something, you can do that, no problem at all. Now, the last two things I've got up here I kind of go hand in hand. Um, 
when Jonathan from Belfast was talking about uh, doing Skype support sessions, um, and is it, is it Shazia? Right. Is, is it, yeah, from Glasgow. You were saying about how the, the, you would hold like a virtual drop-in session for your students. These two tools will let you do that. Now, you, you're probably all familiar with Skype. I'm looking for, yeah? So the idea behind Skype, Skype lets you communicate with people and you can do that by talking to them uh, on a, a webcam or a microphone or you can just type away and that's great. The real power though comes when you combine it with this free service here called Join Me. Again, it's completely free. What Join Me lets you do is this. It lets you broadcast what's on your computer monitor to the internet live. It means you give people a web address they all click on that web address, and then in their web browser, they can see exactly what you've got on your monitor. And this isn't, this isn't one-to-one, this is one-to-many. So you can have 25, 30 students looking at this at the same time. So what this means is, if you combine this with Skype's ability to hold conference calls, you can now hold free what's called webinars, or online tutorials, on demand, free of charge. These two things, by the way, also work on tablets and smartphones, which means a student can engage with this thing at the bus stop. They do not need to be sat in front of a computer. So the, the, the web address is just join me. You can Google it. Complete free of charge. It's a fantastic piece of software. They've literally, uh, yesterday, they released a new iPad app that lets you broadcast from the iPad as well. Previously, it was that you can only use the tablets to view, but now you can actually host these sessions using an iPad if you've, if you've got one. So we tend to find when we're talking about making people's lives easy with administration and logistics, if we could take it back to how do you engage people with mathematics or teaching and learning in general, these two things are the major things because it means you can support people and provide on-demand support for people as and when they want it, particularly mature students, people who've got children or whatever, who for whatever reason physically can't come and see you. Obviously, it's best if they can physically come and see you, but if they can't, you have the options there. That's admin and logistics. <coughs> Teaching and learning. Now, this is a bit theoretical, this bit. Um, there are some resources which I'll, I'll show you in a minute. Um, I've, like I said, I've been doing this for eight years, and in my experience, there are two theories that tend to hold up. The first of which um, is basically been put together by two academics called Mays and Fowler. Um, and what they did, they looked at the kind of learning experiences that the technology can give to students that truly enhance teaching and learning. But then another academic came along called Robin Mason and what they looked at was basically how the integration of technology into our learning culture, into our classroom, how does that impact on what actually what happens face to face? How does that impact on those teaching sessions? And what I tend to find is that the two kind of go hand in hand. You can't separate one out from the other. So I've combined these two things. Uh, Mason Fowler originally coined the term the conceptualisation cycle and there's the outer one, but inside I've got... a. Uh, Robin Mason stuff as well. I just want to talk you through this. So basically, what Mason Fowler said was this, that when you first start using technology, um, most people will say, right, I've got some PowerPoints, I'm going to stick them on the internet. Job done. They call this conceptualization by primary courseware, which is a big posh way of saying, I'm going to put something online and you can read it, and by reading that, you will understand the concept I'm trying to teach you. Could be a handout, could be a PowerPoint, could be video. It doesn't really matter. And that's fine. Nothing wrong with that at all. But what they were saying is that's just stage one. And the mistake that many educators will make, they'll have this belief that that stage one is it. Put a tick in the box, done me your learning thing, off I go. And what these academics were saying is, actually, no, there, there, there are more possibilities to it than that. How this manifests itself in the classroom and the lecture theatre tends to be like this. We'll have the content online and the support and they're separate. So my lecture will take place, no problem at all, and I'll put this stuff up online. But if the internet broke tomorrow, actually, wouldn't impact on my lecture whatsoever, wouldn't impact on my face-to-face -face session. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but this tends to go hand in hand with this, this primary courseware. And I tend to find when people are taking that very first step, this is what they want to do, and quite rightly, because this is an insurance policy, not quite sure about that technology, so let's keep it separate. Nothing wrong with that at all, but it's just stage one. Stage two says, OK, you've got your resources online. We now need the students to start constructing new knowledge. They need to get their hands dirty. I used to call it organic mathematics. The idea is you can't really learn anything by looking at examples. You've got to do the questions. You've got to get things wrong. You've got to learn through failure, as was mentioned earlier this morning. 
So they call this construction by secondary courseware. And um, in terms of technology, what we're essentially talking about is some of those things we mentioned this morning. Things like self-marking quizzes or the Moodle lessons I was referring to. The idea is, rather than having something static that someone can look at and grab and say, I can read this, they have some kind of interaction with the computer system. Could be a model, could be a simulation where they change the variables and see what happens. But the point is they have to do something back into the computer. And then what Mason said, well, actually, how this kind of uh, manifests itself, I think it looks a bit like a, we just had lunch, sausage roll or a fried egg or something, um, is that what you tend to find is that your teaching takes place here, but around this you've got this wrapping of technology. And activities, there's like a diffusion or an os on osmosis, if you like, of activities from the online arena into the face-to-face -face arena and back again. So it could be something like this. You might say, okay, I've got an online discussion form. It might be on Facebook. You say, right, next week we're going to talk about something. But before we do that, I want you to have a conversation on Facebook. So they have that conversation before the lesson takes place. You're then able to pick up the themes that took place from that conversation online and bring them into the classroom. Or you have a really good face-to-face uh, -face kind of Socratic dialogue or something in the classroom, and you go, do you know what, this was so good, we're going to continue it online. So there's a blurring of the boundaries. That's stage two. And typically, in my experience, it will take someone who who's, doesn't know anything about technology at all, it takes them at least a year to go from stage one to stage two. Because they have to try the stage one out stuff first with the current cohort that they've got and see if it works for them. Because the other thing I, I need to say right away is this, that you should only use technology as and where you think it is pedagogically sound to do so. There's nothing wrong with a blackboard. There's nothing wrong with a whiteboard. Right? I'll just get that one out of the way because people think, oh, you know, it's all about technology. No, it's, as long as teaching and learning takes place, it doesn't matter. But it's wherever you think is appropriate. So that's stage two. Stage three. This is the holy grail. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the Moodle system, this is what Moodle is built upon. Um, it's the, the, the technical term uh, for this kind of thing, it was two terms. One's called social constructionism, and the other one is social constructivism. One our idea is people coming together and they're all helping each other out by learning by doing things and observing things. Essentially, this is how we as humans tend to work anyway. If you say, well, if you go to work, it's quite rare that you sit down at work uh, and you have your boss kind of sit you down in rows and go, right, team, I want you to do this, 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 and this, this today. And then they all go away and uh, by themselves and do it on their own and are tested at the end of the workday. That's not how we work. So what the model says is this, that actually, if you aim for an online arena which gives students the ability to choose their learning resources... And by, by this I mean you have maybe five or six different learning resources, but all of them have the same learning destination. So a student can choose whether or not they want to learn something by reading about it, by doing a model of simulation, by watching a video. It doesn't matter which one they pick. The destination, the understanding, the knowledge that's constructed is the same. You then give them an arena online to work collaboratively with one another. Again, it's manifesting some of that behaviour we're seeing with that fantastic Facebook project that was shown earlier. The idea where students have come together and help one another out. It's not plagiarism, because we're not assessing this stuff, it's collaborative activities. The third and final one, and this is the one that's most tricky, particularly for higher education, is joint assignments. We have the technology now, the folks, to actually be able to do this. Google, for example, the Google Drive, the collaborative stuff, that will track each individual member's contribution to a group project. So if you want to, you can, you can grade the group, but if you want to, you can also go into the logs and actually see how much each individual did and grade them accordingly. I'm not saying you should, I'm saying it's a possibility. But what they what were saying is that when we get to this point, this is where we can, you can have a true kind of... Uh, paradigm shift, even if you like, in the way that we do teaching and learning. And we shift from being a sage on the stage to a guide on the side. The idea is we say to the students, this is the learning landscape and I'm going to guide you through it. Not necessarily stand at the front and go, hear ye, hear ye, this is the law according to me. So if that's the conceptualisation cycle, and in my experience, I, mean, I, I, I act as a consultant for schools and colleges and universities, this genuinely does work. It really does work. Um, the question is, then, how do we get there? What do we need to do? I'm a big fan of giving people practical stuff. And kind of, you can tell you used to be a math teacher. Um, a little equation here. Um, essentially, in my experience, this, these are the things that we need to do. 
the practical things that we need to do if we're going to integrate technology properly, in a pedagogically sound way, into our teaching and learning practices. Because essentially, it's not about the technology. It hasn't really been about the technology for the last decade or so, because the technology just kind of works. It's about people. Essentially, it's a change process. And so, in my experience, you need to have each of these things here to implement this change. If you don't, what I've done is I've taken each of the things out. So I've taken vision out. You end up with confusion. If I take skills out, people get anxious. So what I do when I go into a, de a department or a an institution, I won't worry about the technology. I'll look at the people. I'll go, right, how are you feeling? Because you can bet your, bet your bottom dollar. If people are feeling any of these things here, then some of these things are missing up here. So that's what we have to address first. So what I want to do is just go through some of the things that I use, that you can use. Again, these are all free. You can grab them online um, if you want to. So the first one is vision. How do you get a vision? That's quite difficult. I use something called scenario-based design. If you want to know more about it, the web link at the bottom here will tell you all about it. Um, I, could, I could spend half an hour just talking about this, to be honest. Um, but essentially, what this, what this does is this says to an individual, don't worry about the technology. Forget about the technology because it's constantly moving anyway. By the time you think you've got something, something new's come along. Forget about it. Instead, focus on a plain English story of what do you want your students, your learners, to be doing? What do you want them to experience? And don't worry about what is and what isn't possible. Just dream. And so people will write me a story in plain English. Bob logs on, Bob sees this, Bob interacts in this way. Once we know what the vision is, we can then identify the pedagogy that need, or the pedagogies that need to take place in order for this vision to come about. Once we know what the pedagogies are, then and only then do we identify suitable tools and technologies. And by doing it this way, we ensure the technology tool does not wag the educational dog. We never get into a situation of, my department's just bought 15 iPads, we've got to figure out how we're going to use them in education. Then, once you've identified the technologies, then and only then do we then start doing custom training for people. And training's actually the wrong word. It's, it's actually education. Um, and the difference is this, that um, we give them the education so they know how to use these tools in a pedagogically sound way, so that when that tool is replaced by something else, it doesn't matter because they can still use it for the same purpose. So case in point might be Skype at the moment. Everyone knows Skype. Ten years ago, it was MSN Messenger. And before that, it was something called IRC, which is Internet Relay Chat. So, but, but the point was, it doesn't matter what you call it, that the act of someone's kind of sat down at a computer typing away, how are you, all that kind of stuff, that still was taking place. So we educate people how to use these things. So if you want more information, it is there. So this gives people a vision, and it's their vision. It's not my vision, it's their vision. So that we've got immediate buy-in because we're working towards something that they want to do. We then need to give them the skills. Now, uh, so within my department, we go in and we, we help people, but I appreciate that not every institution has got a, a centre for digitally enhanced learning. So I'll, I'll talk a, a bit more about this in depth a little bit later on, but the idea is you can join what's called a community of practice. And again, loads of research has been done into this. It's used in industry as well as academia. Um, this is IBM's model. This is, their community, this is their model community of practice. And essentially what it is, it's a group of people coming together to talk about how they do something. So it's not a group of people who are interested. So it's not, if it was about cakes, for example, it's not a people that come together and go, I like cake. Do you like cake? Yes, I love cake. Fantastic. It's, it's a group of people that come together and go, I make my cakes like this, and I cook it, to, I set the oven at this degree, and I use these ingredients. It's a practical, hands-on group of people that talk about what works and what doesn't. I'll come on to that a little bit later on in terms of where you can find these fine people, but the idea is there are lots of groups out there already that you can tap into straight away. You don't have to wait for someone to kind of ride in a white horse and save you if you want to get involved. Now, in an ideal world, we go, why are we doing it? Oh, we're doing it for the love of the students, student experience, right? Thing is, in my experience, it doesn't, it's not just about academics, but everybody. If something's not directly going to be a benefit to you, you're not really going to pursue it. So you have to basically sit down and figure out, is this going to be a benefit to you? Now, the research has been done. You can get it on Google Scholar, if you so wish, in terms of the benefits of all sorts of different implementations of technology. But irrespective of all that, the number one barrier I come up against uh, when I'm talking to people is this. I do not have time. I do not have time. Now, I, and I used to say it's myself as well, I, when I was a teacher, I don't have time. Until I taught myself to meditate. 
Stay with me on this. <laughs> I did it for a podcast, and there was a, there was a kind of Zen Buddhist dude, and he's at the front, and he's kind of talking to the people, telling them what to do, this, that, and the other. And at the end, he takes questions from people. And some guy sticks his hand up, and he says, you know, this is really valuable. I can see the benefit of this, but I'm a father of two. I'm really busy. I haven't got time. And the, the Buddhist chap at the front, he paused for a second. He went, it's not that you don't have time. He says, it's just not that it's of a sufficiently high priority to you in your life for you to do. And I went, ooh. And that kind of stuck with me. And then I read this article on Lifehacker. I mentioned Lifehacker this morning. Fantastic website. There's a link to it down here if you want to read it in full. But what they were saying, and they weren't talking about educational technology. They were just talking about people. But what they were saying was is this. If you find yourself saying, I don't have time, try changing your language to saying, it's not a priority. And give yourself permission to say that. But if you find when you're saying it, you feel a little bit uncomfortable, perhaps you need to reassess some of your priorities. Resources. Now, there are loads and loads and loads of resources out there. Tim does a grand job of putting resources on the front of the newsletters. What I've done is because, and again, I could spend literally all afternoon showcasing resources. What I've done is I've created a little Pinterest board for you all. The address for it is down here. If you go to this address, you will find around about 25 to 30 resources that you can use free of charge to help you teach mathematics, various mathematical concepts with your students. So there are things like equation editors. Um, who was talking about the... Um, uh, where was it? Oh, Julie, Julie from uh, Cork mentioned she likes functions and graphs. Where are you, Julie? Yeah. There is a lovely online graph plotter on here which means you can basically say to your students, OK, we can teach you these relationships, but actually you can bang equations in and see what happens. So there's lots and lots of different things here. The other thing I should mention um, is that uh, Google Drive, I was talking about earlier, has got a built-in equation editor as well. So students can collaboratively write mathematical equations if they want to. There's also the one thing that I really like, and it's on here, but I can't pick it out. There is an Android app which lets you, with a stylus, write a, uh, write a maths equation freehand. It will then interpret that and turn it into a typed equation and then give you step-by-step -step solution on how to solve it. It's really good, especially for those students. So maybe they had the example about the factorization. So the example is you could say to that student, well, hang on, look, come, look at this. Bung it in and it will explain to you and show you the different steps to how you actually do this thing. So... Um, yeah, lots and lots of stuff there, but if you want to make a note of that, the resources are there. But that's literally just the tip of the iceberg, to be honest. There are loads of things out there. Last thing, action plan. A lot of people think, they go, well, whose responsibility is it to, for, to, to, to develop my CPD and, and enrich the educational uh, opportunities of my students? Whose responsibility is it uh, to integrate technology? There's a clue. It's not about your department, your faculty, or university. If you want to do this, it's up to you. But, as I alluded to before, you're not on your own. Which kind of brings me quite neatly to my last bit, which is personal branding and networking. Like I said before, this is quite new. And the idea, there's a couple, there's, there's three main things I wanted to kind of draw your attention to, really. So it's using technology to connect to people, to say, I'm supporting people who are trying to learn mathematics, or I'm teaching people... I want some help, I want some ideas, I want some resources. Tell me things that work for you. There's a lovely, I mean, hopefully you all, you all know this. If you don't, I might be in the wrong room. Um, this is a lovely website, and it's even got a little button that says community up there, so you can join the community and actually talk to people, talk to educators, and go, hey, I'm trying this, what do you think about this? Here's a resource I found. So if, if you're not already aware of this site, I would urge you, if you only do one thing today, go here, it's fantastic. It's really great. Other things you can do, though, Twitter. Twitter, um, in a poll, in, in an international poll of educators, has been like the number one educational tool for like four or five years running now. It's ridiculous. But the problem with Twitter is a lot of people think it's just about sharing what you had for breakfast this morning or maybe posting a picture of a cat in a funny pose, maybe. Um, so I just wanted to introduce you the concept of these things called hashtags. I mean, Tim said we got a, a conference hashtag today. Now, the idea behind these is... If you put a little message out on Twitter, you can put a little label next to it on these tags. STEM, Science, Technology, Engineering, Mathematics. Northern Ireland Ed Chat, UK Ed Chat. What people can then do is say to Twitter, look, get rid of all the, the, the messages about people's breakfast and the pictures of cats, lovely as they may be. Show me all of the tweets that just have this wording. 
And Twitter will then run away and give you a chronological, in chronological order all of these tweets, recent tweets anyway, that are, t we are with this label. What this means is you can actually start searching and identifying individuals who are posting up useful things on Twitter that are useful to you, and you can then follow them and make them part of your network. The technical term for this is a PLN, or a Personalised Learning Network, that's what it's called. Um, but certainly these two go one step further because they have pre-arranged times every week where they will say to educators, hey, jump on Twitter, let's say, when the UK Ed Chat one is Thursday night at 8 o'clock, jump on Twitter at 8 o'clock and we'll talk about a topic. And there's a little website, people can vote on what the topic they're going to do. But they have a chat and they put these little labels in, but it means that educators from all over the world are able to talk to one another, even though they've never met, even though they don't know who each other are, they're able to follow that conversation and talk to one another, and then if they want to connect via Twitter, they can do, they can make that connection to form up, to kind of solidify this personalised learning network. And Twitter is the number one place, you know I was talking about the skills, about the community of practice, Twitter is the number one place to do it. I started on Twitter two years ago. It's been the best thing I ever did because I, if I'm ever stuck, I know I can jump on Twitter and go, ah, and somebody will get back to me, in average, about 15 to 20 seconds. It's ridiculous. It's like having a conference in your pocket, so to speak. Okay? <laughs> Except the conference in your pocket, I've got like 2,000 followers on Twitter now. So it's brilliant. So even, even if 1% of, of, of the people that follow me get back to me, I'll get a good answer. So, and it's all free. Um, it's also quite good when we talk about engaging with mathematics. If, you've got, uh, if you're supporting PhD students or master's students, you'll tend to find that most researchers or most major researchers will be on here so they can connect to people and actually get uh, results or findings faster than they might normally. So it, it's, it's a really great way. Um, Brian Cox is on there, so it can't be bad. It's great. Um, so yeah, Twitter, is, Twitter is a fantastic tool for making those connections. Now, the last thing I want to show you is this. This is an electronic portfolio, and it's a real electronic portfolio. It's not one I made up. It's a student, I think she's based in America, um, and she's used a free tool called Google Sites to make an electronic portfolio. And we have been teaching all of our staff and all of our students how to use Google Sites, because it's free. The problem with e-portfolios is that many institutions will go, we've got an e-portfolio system, and it serves the strategic need of the institution. Great. But when that student graduates, the e-portfolio either stays with the institution or they have to export it in some god-awful file that they can't actually do anything with later. Google Sites gets around all that. It says, OK, each individual has their own website for life. You have more than one website if you want to, because you can build like online shops with it and all sorts of cool stuff. But we use it about e-portfolios. So we teach our staff and our students how to use Google Sites to create an electronic portfolio. And the rationale for it, and this kind of goes back to, um, is, it, is it Ellen, your Pro Vice Chancellor? Yeah, she was talking this morning about um, employability. And it kind of goes back to this, that the idea is this. When they're at an institution, they can have an electronic portfolio, which can be used for assessment or it can be used for reflection. No problem at all. But there comes a point in their academic career, whilst they're on a degree programme, that they have to start looking to get a job. Because the majority of your students probably won't end up going into academia. They're going to go off to work. Certainly when I did my maths degree, most of my mates become actuaries or accountants. So there comes a point where they need to take that portfolio and flip it to make it open to the world so that employers can look at it and continue to add content to it. So Google Sites lets you do that. You can do pictures, videos, text, sound, and your e-portfolio can be as complicated or as simple as you like. It doesn't have to look like this. Each individual has complete control over what their e-portfolio looks like. But the reason why I'm telling you about it today is this. If you want to start connecting with people on the internet via things like Twitter, of Facebook. You have all these things knocking around. Twitter, Facebook, you might have LinkedIn, Academia, EDU, all these different things. What this lets you do is create a central hub which can then act, uh, and you can then have little spokes that go out to all of your other little online presences. But the point is, if you're working with people, you can say, this is my main hub. This is where you can go to to get all of my information. So we're teaching our students how to do this. There is, I mean, the student stuff is amazing, the stuff that they're doing is brilliant. Uh, and this, the staff stuff, it's, it's interesting, but it's not as good as what the students are doing. The students are doing some phenomenal things. But say, so if you want to know more about that, about how you can use Google Sites to do this, again, the website is all there. And you can build these things on your smartphone and tablet as well. You don't have to have a computer. I was timing this. I've spent about 40 minutes. I wanted to leave about 10 minutes um, for questions. Um, but before I do, I hope it's not too early. I just wanted to wish 
Well, each and every one of you, a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank you ever so much, and if you've got any questions, I'd love to take them now.